Today you're going to be on a fun ride of multiple things, so if you haven't already been amazed. Today, we're pulling the curtain back and taking you inside the Woodland Park Zoo. Tia and Zan are way up in the tree. They're a bit shy, but we'll take you up there. New exhibits. New animals. <laughs> Who do we have there? And new adventures await right now on Cairo 7. Hey there, welcome to Wildlife, a look inside Woodland Park Zoo. I'm your host, Matthew Smith, and we have a ton to get to today, including our fine feathered friends here. Today, we're talking all about understanding animals. Hey, we all know about our cats and dogs and what they're telling us at home, right? But what about here at the zoo? You know, these animals are just as vocal. You can hear it there, right? And it's the job of the keepers to learn the language of these animals. And as you are about to learn, there is no one-size-fits-all solution when you're talking about caring for so many different types of animals here. Taking into account their natural history, but also looking at what that animal is showing you that specific day. Today, we'll be exploring the idea of animal groupings and how keepers encourage natural behaviors within a zoo setting. We'll even get you an up-close, personal look at a hungry otter. But first today, we want to talk all about animal husbandry. Now, what exactly is that? Well, it depends on what animal you're talking about. Take a look here. They're clicker training a pig. Yes, clicker training a pig. Really, what they're doing is they're creating natural environments for these animals to interact with. It's all about building trust, predictability, and understanding. Gunner! Whether it's a red-tailed hawk like Gunner here, swooping around the zoo, or a tiger like a zool, feasting on this carcass. There's a simple term I hear so often from the trainers here. I said you finished that one. That term, or phrase, is animal husbandry. It comprises all aspects of care, so it's feeding, and it's cleaning, and it's breeding, training, enriching. Okay, sounds simple enough, but as Rachel explains it, there's more to it than at first blush. A river otter chases its meal, in this case a salmon. Simple, right? You see the otter snacking on a salmon, but the keepers feed at specific times so they can ensure an up-close look at an animal. So this is Priscilla. She's our 17-year-old boss lady. She's, she's my manager. A great example can be found over at the Willowong. A seed stick is fun for me. I mean, who doesn't want to make a new friend? It doesn't hurt that they're colorful, beautiful birds. But the seed stick also gives trainer Susan a shot at weighing these guys and gals. 60, and you're 96 grams. Priscilla, can you step down for a minute? And when it comes to training, you see Lolita here. She takes commands, flying stump to stump. We understand that as training. But Rachel says the new thinking of training goes far beyond this. What we know about learning is that learning happens all the time behavior is happening all the time. You and I are behaving right now. And we can't ignore the fact that we play a big part in their social groupings every single day. Yes, what Janelle just explained, that is the part easily missed. When you see a tiger feasting on a treat inside the zoo, someone put it there, as we'll see later today. I know. Training also happens with these big cats. You wanna come say hi? Oh, that's good. But just like our cameras were here to bring you these visuals, visitors also roam the zoo, and trainers are always here. So if every interaction results in a behavior, the folks here have to get so many things right so that an animal can be comfortable having a baby or accepting training so that they can help in their own medical care. Good boy. Another aspect we'll explore today. But most of all, it's about paying attention. Watch Gunner one more time. He sort of fumbles a chance to snag this toy. But early on, his trainers tell me they were already seeing signs that he was struggling. But you all were keyed in, right? So what were you seeing? The second he comes out, we're paying attention to everything. We're paying attention to what his eyes are doing. Where is he looking? How quickly he's going from point A to point B. How quickly he's responding to those trainers tells us w what he's feeling that day. In the end, Gunner was fine especially considering either he or Lolita, another bird that trains with staff here, well, they're free to go. They could choose to fly away. 
unlike some animals, they could just take off. And we'll explore that today. The idea of choice. Because animals here have more choice than you may think. But to offer options means you have to understand the animal itself. And that's part of our job. It's a species as a whole, but also identifying the individual and what they're feeling at the time. That's that's a big ask for anyone, but we first need to acknowledge that, yes, they have feelings. It's easy to forget that on top of the animal themselves, the work behind the exhibit is so important. It's tailor fitting things from metal work to heavy machinery to create that experience, that environment for these animals to live in. Now, in season one, we showed you how they can create trees and branches from scratch, but this time, this year, we're talking about an entire exhibit for the Komodo dragons, and neither the team that works with the animals or the specialists who build this stuff, well, neither of them are backing down from this challenge. It gets harder and harder to retrofit. So, instead, they'll fully rebuild. Notice where lead keeper Alyssa and I are standing. Take a wider look. No glass. This is a full redo, ground up. The flooring we're standing on is new. So is the roof, so is the lighting. The bulb technology has improved, the bulb fixture technology has improved. All of this helps Komodo dragons, big or small, catch some much needed artificial light when they're not outdoors. But that's not all. There's also a new dig pit. It may look like cement, but this thick clay actually goes several feet down. We look at what the animals do in the wild. Um, so I have co-workers that have been to Komodo Island and have taken pictures and videos and shared them with us. We know more about how to take better care of Komodos now, so we want to do better. As Dr. Bonnie explains it, there's got to be flexibility here. Like Komodos, red rough lemurs tend to sun. But what you, as the visitor, don't see here is a hidden heat lamp. But in the end, between guest views and animal needs, the animals have to come first. Or if we you know, make the most appealing view for the animal right here, then the visitors can have the best picture. But then what are the animals? <laughs> what is their experience? Then they have this little, little spot. That's not good, right? <laughs> I think there'd be a lot of relief from people just to hear that that's the thinking of yeah. today. You know, Komodos are supposed to, they do things like they dig a lot. They, they sun, they bask, they, they soak in the pool. We weren't seeing ours do that a whole lot. And we went, like, is it, you know, what's part of the environment? What are we missing? That led to this. Take a look at this sped up version of the metal work, the cement work, all those fine touches. What it takes to rework an entire exhibit from the ground up. The end goal here, to allow for those natural behaviors. And it's not just what you'll be seeing. The old way we had to like physically walk a dragon through a space with a keeper. And the older dragons that we had before the trio that we have now, we're very used to people working with them. These new dragons we're working with as protected contact, so it wouldn't be as safe for us to go in with them as it was our other dragons. Meaning new passageways and new plans, as always, with the animal front of mind. I do feel like a giddy kid sometimes. <laughs> Because it, it is amazing to work with them in the first place and know that we're doing something that is really improving their health and welfare is just limitless. And that, that's what we all come here to do every day. You are taking a look at Buttercup. And Buttercup, well, she's a special gazelle. Everybody seems to love her. We're going to talk a little bit about how to understand animals and what makes them tick. From Buttercup. <laughs> to Azul. Oh, good girl. We'll explore how keepers give animals a choice to participate in their own training. What there is, is the choice to participate. So it's the minor difference between you must come in at this time versus I'll leave the door open. Cairo 7 Cares is here to help those who need it most. By supporting local nonprofits and events to help give more people access to basic needs. Let's work together to make a difference. Right here in Western Washington, Cairo 7 Cares. Welcome back inside Woodland Park Zoo. This beautiful gazelle here is Buttercup, and Buttercup is kind of a fan favorite of the zookeepers here. She has an interesting story, and I want to talk about her today because we want to talk about understanding animals and the special relationship they have with the keepers here inside the zoo. Buttercup. 
the savannah is an exciting place. From giraffe to this feisty ostrich. Add in some zebras and these geese. Well, it's hard to imagine anyone standing out. Oh, hey. You want a biscuit? Then again, Buttercup is pretty special. As Lauren explains to me, the other gazelles appear for feedings, but they tend to keep their distance, not Buttercup. Well, a lot of times we'll be out here just working and she just kind of appears at your side. Yeah. And the kind of general rule is, is if Buttercup wants attention, you gotta give the Buttercup attention. So what do you do when animals act differently than you'd expect? Janelle tells me they have to carefully track that behavior to fully understand it. And so it's taking into account their natural history, but also looking at what that animal is showing you that specific day. At what point do you decide that might just be their preference versus this is a peculiar behavior and we need to work on that? That goes along with the trial and error, giving it as many different types of opportunities to exhibit that behavior as we think we can and then looking at their reaction to those behaviors. And it might go into that individual's history, where it came from. In Buttercup's instance, she had a horn injury when she was little. She required extra attention and hands-on work, and for whatever reason, she decided she liked it and never stopped seeking it out. She likes her ears massaged, jaw, and down her neck. Huh. But understanding that an animal like Buttercup can have different likes, dislikes, preferences, that matters because reading behavior is all the experts have to go off of. Chewy, can you come stand? Chewy, can you scale? And often, Tucker. the behaviors happen all at once, as I found out. It just takes a lot of focus, just like, um, Maybe a teacher with their students, keeping track of everybody, knowing who likes what, who can't stand next to whom. <laughs> Are you already reading behaviors just in this moment here? Uh-huh, yes. So for example, this bird right now that I'm feeding, I'm calling her Peso. She is a little chick that hatched out about four months ago. Celine, a penguin keeper, juggles the wants and needs of more than 40 penguins. Some birds are shy. Excuse me, Lee. Can we go wait? Others? are less shy. There goes Tucker. <laughs> I was going to go check on your jeans. Celine has to pay attention to everything. Yeah? Even how I'm affecting today's feeding. And I'll hand you a couple. After all, this isn't just about nutrition. It's about getting eyes on each animal and making sure they're healthy and acting like themselves. And it's like watching the most elaborate soap opera Real Housewives you will ever see <laughs> in any of these. So they have social you know, drama and structure, and these two are friends, and these two can't get along, and this one's always going to take the fish from that one. What are you guys fighting over? And to have our caretakers that have been here with them so long that they're able to just look at a group of 46 penguins and know exactly who everybody is and their relationships and their personality and their preferences like that is, is unbelievable to me. And somehow, much to both Dr. Bonnie and my own amazement, there, that's radar. Celine can still find those subtle differences, like who's molting. Now, all penguins go through it, but it isn't a lot of fun. Here we go, Cruz. Good <clears throat> job, bud. Or who may be in pre-molt. They gotta bulk up on food because they'll soon need that energy. But don't forget, these animals need to trust their keeper. So we have to build that trust. So every time you see any animal in this institution doing anything with a keeper, think about all the background of that is establishing a line of communication between that person and that animal from nothing. It, it sounds like you're talking about us understanding the animal, but it almost feels like the animal has to understand our intention. Absolutely, yeah. So it's a lot about predictability. I would, my dream in life is to be Dr. Doolittle. I would love to just, <laughs> can you just tell me? I want to have a conversation with you. But they clearly understand what we're trying to do. So it's more about predictability. All right, you're extra hungry today. Whether it's a penguin or a gazelle, they have expectations, just like we do. And when they work together... I can check her out and make sure she's hydrated, so I can do like a little skin tent. And if it goes back, I know that she's in good condition. That communication can allow for trainers to do health checks, and in some rare cases, a foot race to encourage some natural jumps. After all, even the animals who don't act as you may expect can still exhibit natural behaviors with a little help. Can I go to super in peace?
So you probably have a better understanding now why some animals are all together in an exhibit and some are solo. They're trying to keep these animals wild. So then why do we see training of the animals inside of a zoo? Let's give you an inside look. What do you see? It's time for tiger training. Azul. Which means this majestic big cat. Oh, good girl. Is out. We find Azul pacing, checking her enclosure, and Hi. occasionally engaging. Hi. What are you doing? I know. What's happening? Today, the team here at Woodland Park Zoo is set up to train, but Azul has other plans. She's an estrus, or in heat. Azul's body is telling her it's time to mate, which means aside from some grunts. Oh, that feels so good. And some occasional strolls past where she typically train. She's not too interested in today's planned activities. Yeah, she's not going to interact. She'll come back, but she's not going to do anything. That's fine, because inside the zoo, training, feeding, everything, it's voluntary. So if Azul has other plans, that's OK. There's no such thing as 100% choice, but what there is is the choice to participate. So it's the minor difference between you must come in at this time versus I'll leave the door open. You're welcome to come in or training sessions at two o'clock. You must participate with coercive techniques, not something we would ever do versus here I am. I have treats and I've got my target pool. You're welcome to come up or you're welcome to stay out there in the sun. No, there's no frustration because one thing we heard earlier today is at play here. The training, as you and I think of it, Azul! may not happen, but Azul is still absorbing everything around her right now. Every time we interact with an animal, that is a training session. It's not just a formalized, OK, I'm going to give you treats if you do X, Y, Z. It's every time we're here, we're interacting with them right now and forming their opinion of us as humans. So if I were to do something very unpredictable right now, they're probably going to run away. Do different animals trust on a different schedule? Absolutely. It's very species specific. All right, blondie, blondie, grabby, grabby. Come on, girl. So let's check in on one of the other species, the colobus monkey. Here, trainer Amy. Grabby, grabby, mouth. Is working with grabby and blondie. Good girl, that was a good one. We want to stop here because trust is a very important notion right now between this pair of aging female monkeys and Amy. Like most keepers here, Amy works with a variety of animals. What are you doing? Come on! Including the red ruffed lemurs we featured earlier this year. But when it comes to Blondie and Grabby, Amy is a newer face. Well, my trust bank is a little, <laughs> did get a little depleted. Last Thursday, they both went down and went under anesthesia. So I have a little bit of, of that with me. So sometimes it's really nice to lower the expectations. Decades ago, zoos thought of training very differently. These days, zookeepers are more aware not only of how the animals are reacting, but how they react to the animals. Hi. So if Grabby gets Grabby. No, nope. and I'm just going to ignore that. There's no reward, but there's also no punishment. It's like she's demanding food. If I'm starting to hand her something and I start hearing that, I just stop what I'm doing and wait a moment. And then when she stops, I'm like, OK, here we go. And the stakes can get much bigger, too. <laughs> You're looking up close at a pouch check. Inside, a teensy tiny joey, a tree kangaroo. This is very personal. Those goods are essentially OKs to keep moving forward with the check as the mama, Alana, signals it's OK for the keepers to do so. So the nose is right here. This is the joey's head. Now, we met Alana last season, but the real magic happened before her joey was visible. The team at the Woodland Park Zoo had to work with her, train her, really, to volunteer that pouch check. Any time her feet came off the bar, we stopped. And that's how she learned to say, OK, this is cool. I'm willing to participate to the point where we'd insert one finger into her little pouch and then two fingers, and then maybe pull a little bit. All of a sudden, next thing you know, we're getting full on video and learning about the Joey in her pouch before it's visible yeah. and big enough to be out on its own. Yeah. Hi. Oh, my God. Is there a particular reason that you really want to reinforce that behavior so you have that chance to look inside? If there's a baby in there, you don't want to put the male in. The only way to know that is to check. The old way to do it would be just quick, get your hands on her really quick, take a quick look, and then release her. That's a little stressful on the tree kangaroo. It's a little stressful on the staff. What if we could train Alana to voluntarily participate, so not just to get that one-time check, Hi. but to document 
the growth of the joey in the pouch before it's visible. And scene. That's just what they did, and it allowed them to track the joey from inside the pouch until Alana's baby, an endangered species, was ready for the rest of the world. She's watching and she's listening. <laughs> so whether it's a monkey, a kangaroo, or a tiger. Oh, what a good girl. The training may look and feel different, but there's always a purpose, and there's a continued goal to improve how it all works. All of it starting with how the trainers approach the animals here inside the zoo. Being tuned into, are they feeling fear? What's the motivation? Are they feeling excited, happy? We can't know that. We don't speak the same language. All we can do is try to get them in the most positive mindset possible and set the whole scene and the whole team up for success as best we can. So far, we spent the day trying to understand animals better, the art and science of it all. So, for instance, when we talk about food, what motivates them? One animal may love this delicious flower, whereas another, well, they want to eat meat. But what about the animals in your life? Talking about house pets, do they have any crossover? Coming up, how you can use some of the same training tactics the zoo uses right from the comfort of your own home. And it's what we set up to indicate yes. That is exactly what we were looking for, and you're about to receive one of your favorite treats. But real quick before the break, a little trivia for you. We just went to a feeding with Malayan tigers, Bumi and Azul. So your question is, which species of tiger was extinct at the start of the 21st century? The Caspian, the Balinese, the Malayan, or the jab. Here's a quick hint. There is more than one right answer, so stew on that. And we'll be right back with your answer and much, much more when your look inside Woodland Park Zoo returns. Cairo 7 Cares is here to help those who need it most. By supporting local nonprofits and events to help give more people access to basic needs. Let's work together to make a difference. Right here in Western Washington, Cairo 7 Cares. Today you're gonna to be on a fun ride of multiple things. So if you haven't already been amazed. Today, we're pulling the curtain back and taking you inside the Woodland Park Zoo. Tim and Zan are way up in the tree. They're a bit shy, but we'll take you up there. New exhibits. New animals. <laughs> Who do we have there? And new adventures await right now on Cairo 7. Welcome back. We've spent weeks here trying to bring you a little closer to these animals under the canopy at Woodland Park Zoo. Now, one thing I noticed bringing you these stories is that deep connection between the staff and these animals. Now, chances are, if you have a house pet, you may have that similar connection. Don't get it twisted. Your house pet is nothing like the animals here inside the zoo. But we can take away some things when it comes to training. So I came here to the Rose Garden outside of Woodland Park Zoo to meet up with curator Rachel Salant. She's gonna show us the similarities and how we can take away, learn from what they do inside the zoo. Good, Annabelle. As Annabelle the pig trots out her trainer's voice. So fast. You almost missed the sound of that clicker. Take it. But if you listen carefully. Good. You'll hear a whistle, which in this case, gets her to bring back a wand. Good. But listen one more time as she impressively unfurls this banner. Come on, Billy. And you'll hear that very different sound, a clicker. That noise is really hard for me to replicate. It's hard. They're not just going to hear it in the wild, that sort of thing. And it's what we set up to indicate yes. That is exactly what we were looking for. And you're about to receive one of your favorite treats. And our zoo animals are not pets. We don't want to mix the two up. But because learning is learning is learning, the tools we use to teach our domestics at home are the same tools and the same principles that we use to teach our domestic dogs and cats. Come here, Diego. Good. Sit. Good. Okay, so clicker training works for Diego, but tigers, gorillas, rhinos? Look. I think of this large animal. All right. And I think there's no way this is the same type. Is that still follow that same idea? A hundred percent. The exact same principles apply. So for my dog, it might be really helpful for him to be able to lie down like this. If we go to the vet, 
good boy. He's presenting his paw to me in my flat hand so I can maybe examine his paws or his nails. They can do that with the tigers as well. Good. Follow it up with a favorite snack. All right. Tigers or pigs? Yes, training is possible. We even showed you earlier today with those colobus monkeys. Up. Good girl. Here you go. The signals, the animals. Hand. That may change, but. Oh, good girl. It's the same principle or idea. There is a bigger takeaway than that, though. There's an entire philosophy of training that you can use with your pets. The trip to the vet may look super fancy here, but they have to get them into crates just like you do with your pets. But in the zoo, animals do it willingly. And Rachel tells me you can get your pet to do the same. If they realize that, you know what, I could associate this crate with positive things, you can train your house cat to voluntarily enter that crate. And that's exactly what we do here at the zoo with our animals. These animals that we cannot just pick up and shove in the crate and take to the vet. It all comes back to trust. No animal in the zoo, whether it's a large primate, a tiny insect, or an elusive jag just shows up as you see him in the zoo. From birth to habitat, from plants to the creation of an entire exhibit. Not to mention the work put in behind the scenes just to take care of these animals. Stuff as simple as cleaning to make sure that life replicates the wild. These keepers care because these animals deserve it. Good Bailey. And whether your pet looks like the zoo animals or not, your pet deserves that care too. I think that's the one thing I'd love people to know about their, their pets at home is they all have brains, every single one of them, and they are all capable of learning. That's gonna do it for us today. I hope you learned something about what it takes to care for all of these animals here inside the zoo. I know I have. But before we go, let's give you the answer to your trivia question. Which species of tiger was extinct at the start of the 21st century? Was it the Caspian, the Balinese, the Malayan, or the Javan? The correct answer is the Caspian, Balinese, and Javan. These three tiger species are all extinct. As far as the Malayan tiger goes, it is estimated that there are under 1,400 left in the wild. Now next time, we're gonna be focusing on a different aspect of care here inside the Woodland Park Zoo. I can't wait to share those stories, but we do have to wait just a little longer. Until next time, I'm Matthew Smith. We'll see you then.